As you know, Paul wrote four books while he was imprisoned during his imprisonment of 18, 18 <laughs> of AD 63. And one of the letters is a little peculiar. And the reason that it's peculiar is because Paul's letters, by and large, can be categorized in two categories. And that is letters to congregations and letters to individuals, like pastoral letters. But there is one letter that doesn't fit neatly into either category because it addresses an individual, but it also addresses others as if they are clearly intended to be reading over this individual's shoulders and then they together were to take this letter and make everybody in the congregation aware of what it said. As Paul writes letters to individuals, pastors, he gives them exhortation and advice. And while he doesn't tell them to share the direct information with them, he encourages them to conduct their lives in such a way that the things that he writes are reflected. But Paul here says he's speaking to an individual. He is speaking it in the hearing of several other individuals who are officers of the church with the intention that they should internalize everything that's being said and that the entire congregation be told what Paul is trying to share. Uh, last week, Greg Treader stopped in and he did an excellent exhibition uh, of the book of Philemon. Very factual information. The odd thing is that I was supposed to go and speak to his congregation and the Lord spoke to me specifically that I was supposed to speak on Philemon, the same book. And as he spoke, I found out why. It was because he focused, and rightly so at that time, on Philemon. And God had laid it on my heart to focus on Onesimus. First, both these men attended the church and worked in the city in Colossae. Colossae was a very, very Greco-Roman town. And the institution of slavery in Colossae had adopted a very Greek, very Roman understanding of who a slave was, what a slave's responsibilities were, what should happen when a slave ran away. And their thoughts did not include much consideration of Jewish law. For these were Greeks. The name Philemon is a Greek word that means affection. And the name Onesimus, a Greek name, means profitable. 
This is a very, very non-Jewish story. And I think sometimes people miss the nuance of this story because they connect it to what they know about slavery in the context of the Jewish world. You see, in the Jewish world, slaves had certain rights. People who sold themselves into slavery for economic reasons were guaranteed that they would have an opportunity to become freemen every seven years. Not only did they have the opportunity to walk away as a free man, it was the responsibility of the owning master to make sure that they had what they needed in order to start a fresh life. There were penalties in Judaism for killing a slave unjustly. There were even penalties for, trading, uh, for treating a slave unjustly to include what's said in Deuteronomy 20, uh, 25, I believe, where if a slave was widely known to be abused and treated badly and ran away, the master who caught that slave, a different man, need not send him back to his original master and was under no penalty of the law for keeping that slave to prevent him from being treated badly. All of these wonderful rules had no place in Rome or in Greece. You see, basically a slave fell into two categories. The first category was this chattel. A ch piece of chattel is a thing. And then there were those who were highly educated that were considered to be extremely valuable chattel that you had to treat well. Because not to treat them well, you may suffer tremendous loss because of the services they were able to provide. You see, no occupation was forbidden to a Roman slave. None. Most accountants and most physicians, most, were slaves. It used to be said in ancient Rome that the first most expensive thing that a man might ever possess would be his land. And the second, his slave. It represented a tremendous, tremendous economic expenditure. Depending on what a slave did, going everywhere from being a field hand, being a miner, doing jobs that had hard physical labor, they may be treated worse than a dog, having just enough food to eat. And those on the other end might be treated at the very least civilly so they won't think of running and at best treated like a son or a daughter. Onesimus knew the penalty for most slaves who ran. It was crucifixion. And in this period of history, the, cru the crucifixion of slaves was rampant. At the very least, each slave that was caught, and there were so many slaves that were running, there were companies that were pro pro professional 
slave catchers. Each slave that was apprehended would be branded and the brand would be with a hot iron in the forehead with the letters F-U-G, Fugigato, Fugitive, so that everyone would know. And one of the difficulties with that, it was a requirement of law, but one of the difficulties was you could not sell a slave that had been a runaway which meant the economic power that was tied up and the investment in that slave went through the floor. They weren't worth a fraction of what the master had paid and the investment he had made in them to get them training. It wasn't worth anything. It was not uncommon for slaves who ran and who were branded to lose all position and wind up working in the mines or in the fields because they had become worth very, very little. There were so many slaves in Rome itself that when they took a census, they found that there were three slaves to every freeman. There was legislation at one point to require that all slaves wear specific types of clothing so that they could be recognized from freemen. And the legislation was abruptly halted when they realized that if they were able to identify each slave, each slave would be able to identify each non-slave by their different mode of clothing, and the slaves would begin to realize just how many slaves there were and just how few freemen there were, and that it might spark rebellion. And in the 200 years prior to the writing of, of Philemon, there had been huge slave rebellions. Some of them severe, and some of them that took the legions to put down. You remember a fellow named Spartacus? That wasn't just a movie, that was real. Where one leader and 73 gladi gladiators escaped to training camp, and along the way, people of low estate who were tired of being treated the way they were being treated, followed along and came with them. Slaves, abandoned, service slaves, and they began to teach them all to fight, until finally they had an army that was so strong that they held off the legions for two years and the Romans were constantly in fear of slave rebellion. And as a result, they dealt with it ruthlessly. You see, there was that huge dichotomy. Most slaves were treated as if they were a thing, just a thing. Most pets in Roman households were of more esteem than their best slave. How widespread was slavery? Even the poorest Roman ordinarily had one or two slaves. This is the backdrop in the setting where Onesimus being in the city of Colossae, a city that was recognized as being so Roman, even though they have a Greek background, they were so recognized and identified with Rome. Rome called Colossae a free Roman city. In other words, they didn't require tremendous Roman oversight because they were considered to be, in all respects, 
as secure in Roman philosophy as well. And this is where the church of Philemon, the church at Colossae, met together with a great many Roman converts. The remainder of the setting, we have a slave who may have known what he was potentially going back to. Let me ask you this, you ever have somebody rip you off? I mean, really, somebody you lent something to, somebody that you gave something, somebody to do to help you out, and they took it and they broke it and they never said anything. They took it and they took off. You couldn't find it or them. Do you remember what it was like in the weeks and the months after that? Every time somebody would mention their name, your blood would start to boil a little bit. Just the thought of that name, to lose out. Can you imagine Philemon? He's lost the slave. Whatever value that slave had for whatever he did in his household was now diminished to almost nothing. And then there's the indication that he actually stole something from Philemon. And Philemon is, he, as a Christian, is fighting this thing that comes up and tells him you've got every right to hate. You have rights to deal with this slave. Those who are round about him as elders of the church, knowing that he has every right. Now, on the other side, Philemon has taken off. Whatever his reasons were, if he's stolen something, we know that the guy's heart is not right before God. It's a thief. Certainly he knows that by running that he has just cost his master a great deal because his worth has gone down the two. Somehow he runs into Paul, chained between soldiers, is put in a position where he has to listen to what Paul has to say. And he gets saved. And how do you know he was really saved? How do you know that? He begins to get involved and actually do something that's profitable for the gospel. Paul calls him a fellow worker. He says, I would have kept him, but it wasn't up for me to do that. I have to have your permission. I recognize your ownership of, of Onesius. He's been working for who knows how much time under Paul's direction. And now the Holy Spirit begins to speak louder and louder and louder in his ears saying, Onesimus, son, you gotta make this right. You know you can't go on like this. You know you've got to go back. And he puts it off, and he puts it off, and he puts it off until his continuing closeness to Christ puts him on a collision course with the sin in his life. And he is at a place where he has to make a decision what do I do? And he 
the fog in his thinking clears. And he says, I know what I got to do. I got to go, I got to go tell Paul who I really am. And I've got to go home and face whatever the consequences, whether it be branding or whether it be the fifth flagellum being whipped with the three tongue whip with pieces of bone and glass embedded or whether because I'm now not worth anything. Maybe it's the cross. But I know I can't live with this sin in my life. And he makes a choice for Jesus. James says, faith without works is dead. I suggest to you that the evidence of faith is works. He makes a decision. So now we have a mindset for Philemon and we have a mindset for Onesimus. So how does he decide on what day it's time to take that plunge? This portion of scripture tells us that Paul had decided to send Onesimus back. Oh. And by the way, folks, we have to ask the question, if we know Roman law, how long did Paul know he was a runaway slave? You see, if you were a Roman citizen and you knew that somebody was a runaway slave, you had 20 days to report that to the authorities. And if you didn't, you were looking at the same punishment as the slave. Paul's in jeopardy. Onesimus is in jeopardy. And Paul chooses to hear God. The untold story. And he calls Onesimus in. And one other fellow, and he says, I've got two letters that I need to send to the church of Colossae. Colossae. And he looks at Onesimus and he says, I prayed about it and God separated you out to take the letters. At that moment, Onesimus packs up all of his fear He looks fully into the face of God. I can just imagine tears running down his face and saying to God, I care more about you and my relationship with you than I care about what might happen to me. And he makes the trip. The second letter that Paul sends is that rather peculiar one that's to everybody. And he says, verse 3, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God making mention of thee always in my prayers. <coughs> hearing of thy love and faith, which, did, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the, communic that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the knowledge of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Therefore, though I might be 
much bold in Christ to enjoin me that which is convenient. Yet, for love's sake, I rather beseech you, I beg you, being such and one as Paul the aged, I'm an old guy, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I beseech thee for my son, Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. He got saved while I was chained up. Which in times past was to thee unprofitable, because but now profitable to thee and me. This is a play on words. Do you remember what the name Onesimus means? <laughs> profitable. And he's saying here, his name was profitable, but you know the guy's character was terrible, and he was unprofitable. But now, I can tell you, he lives up to his name. Whom I have sent again, though thou receive him, that is, my own bowels, whom I would have retained with me, that in, the, in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind, I would do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were or necessarily but unwilling but willing for perhaps he therefore departed for a season so that shouldest receive him forever when he left without Jesus he was unprofitable to you he's come back with a heart to serve God and to be your servant, truly your servant. Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother, beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If thou count me therefore a partner, Receive him as myself. I, Paul, have written it, written it with mine own hand. I will repeat it. Albeit, I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thine own self besides. In other words, you never found Jesus without me. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Having confidence in, in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. But withal, prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers, I shall be given unto you. There salute thee, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. And who is standing in the midst of these men and women as he hands them the letter? Onesimus. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a jam like this before. Certainly most of us have never been in, been in slavery. 
you ever done something that you know you never should have done, but you couldn't find it inside to make it right with somebody else? Knowing that there might be serious penalties that have to be paid if you came clean. I have a real heart for this guy Onesimus. I'll tell you why. Some of you have heard my testimony. Some of you haven't. But I'd just like to just briefly give you a little piece of it. <coughs> but before I do, I was thinking in my heart about this business, about being willing to lose out for yourself, to do something for somebody else. As I was researching to do this message, I ran across something I'd never read before. It was a letter that was written by one of the early church leaders in the first century. It was Clement of Rome. You know, Paul wrote First and Second Corinthians, actually he wrote three letters. One of them was lost. What we actually have is first and third Corinthians. And he wrote to them because they got way off the track in dealing with each other. They would get together for meals like us and people would bring it in potluck. And the rich people were bringing in rich food and they were bringing it in just enough for their rich buddies while poor people who had nothing to eat who were members of the same church, people who were Christians, and they sat in the corner and they watched the rich folks eat, and they didn't have anything. And Paul condemned that in the strongest form. And he said, when you walk in that church door, everybody, Jew, Greek, bond, free, foreigner, everybody is equal before God. Get a hold of it. Put aside your prejudices and provide for everybody as best you're able. It appears that the church at Corinth had done away with their problem. They corrected it. But then just several years later, a delegation came from the church at Corinth to Rome. And they met there with a conclave of elders who were then, which was then the way the church was run. It was a group of pastors. 